YouTube channel. And if you have a question, don't hesitate to either uh, type it in the chat and keeping my eye on that or to just unmute your mic and ask me a question at any time. So uh, the chapter deals with four different functional groups, right? The first one is ethers, and we're gonna spend a fair amount of time talking about ethers, something we haven't really discussed much at all. The other one is an epoxide. So an epoxide is a three-membered ring that is an ether. So we're gonna talk about epoxides. And if you're like, is that what we need from an alkene, an MCPBA, right? If you took, say, you know, one butene and you treat that with MCPBA, uh, one, two, three, four, and do you make an, is that what you mean? Is that an epoxide? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. That would be an epoxide. So you already learned one way to make an epoxide. This, the kind of the second part of the chapter deals with thiols and sulfides. I'm not gonna spend an abundance of time on thiols or an abundance of time on sulfides. A sulfide is the sulfur analog of an ether, right? An ether has an oxygen between two R groups and a sulfide has a sulfur between two R groups. But I am gonna touch on it a little bit because I feel like I'd be remiss to not bring it up. Uh, most of the people who take this class are going to enroll in biochemistry. And so you'll see thiols and things like cysteine and stuff like that. So I will I'll cover that a little bit with you. Anyhow, let's start with an introduction to ethers. And again, like I said, it's a, it's a functional group you haven't discussed a whole lot so far in the class. Um, an ether, you've got two R groups and then you have an oxygen in between them, right? So unlike an alcohol, where you have an OH bond, right? You have an oxygen hydrogen bond. It can participate in hydrogen bonding. An ether, a pure sample of ether does not have hydrogen bonding. And so they have lower boiling points than analogous alcohols. Another thing is that the R groups can be an alkyl group, just like a methyl, ethyl, propyl, butyl, anything like that. An aryl group, so aryl would be an aromatic ring, right? It could just be an aromatic ring, something like that. Or a vinyl group, so you remember the difference between a vinyl group and an allyl group, so a vinyl group is something like this. And it says not an acyl group, because an acyl group is when you have a carbonyl, is when you have a carbonyl with something attached to it. And in that case, if you had, you know, a carbon, oxygen, and a carbon, but then you have a carbonyl here, that's, that's not an ether here, and then like a ketone or some, something crazy like that. You remember, when you're identifying functional groups, you have to take the 30,000 foot view and say we have R group, oxygen, carbonyl, another R group. And so when we evaluate that, we see that this is in fact an ester, okay? So um, I had a question about that this morning with somebody. So um, yeah, there we go. So you have to be able to identify the ether as a functional group. Well, the thing is, is that you find ethers all over the place in naturally occurring compounds and synthetic compounds as well. The book has a few more examples, but one of them here is a cool one, fluoxetine. You've probably heard of the drug Prozac before, which is an antidepressant. And what makes Prozac kind of an interesting drug is if you look at, you know, the top 200 marketed drugs by sales, uh, you see very few drugs that have fluorine in them, very, very few. And so Prozac is a really unique compound in that it has fluorine in it. Another one is vitamin E. You see you have a carbon oxygen carbon bond in there. And then morphine, which is named after Morpheus, the god of dreams, right? You have carbon oxygen and carbon in there. And of course, you know, morphine is an analog of codeine and heroin. And so heroin would also have an ether in it as well. So there's, and there are many, many other examples, but those are just a smattering of them. And you can maybe look around and find some others that you might find interesting. Anyhow, let's get into naming ethers. And there's a couple of ways to name ethers. You know, what's interesting is if you think about all the nomenclature that I ever taught you in Organic One, if you took that class with me, we always started with IUPAC first, and then we went to common names. Well, ethers, in the ethers chapter, we start with common names, and then we go to IUPAC after. And you can imagine why we're starting with common names. It's because they are ubiquitous. All chemists love to use common names for ethers. The only time we don't use common names that I, that I can think of is when you're dealing with an ether that's just too darn big to give it a common name. So here's how you do it. All you have to do is identify each R group. What are the R groups? The eight R groups that you know. Methyl, ethyl, propyl, isopropyl, butyl, terbutyl, secbutyl, and isobutyl. You arrange them in alphabetical order and then you put the word ether at the end. That's it, man. So let's say you have this ether here. You have a methyl group. You have an ethyl group. You'd call it 
ethyl methyl ether, right? You put the two R groups in alphabetical order. The next one here, we have a tert butyl group on one side, and then we have a methyl on the other. We alphabetize according to the letters B and M, so we call this tert butyl methyl ether. Um, if you read the little blurb in the textbook, you'll know that we use an improper acronym for this compound. We call it MTBE, which would be methyl terbutyl ether. And again, it's incorrect. It's not the correct way of naming it, but this is how we name it, or this is the acronym, I should say, that we give it. And this compound um, used to be used as an anti-knocking agent in gasoline until it was found in groundwater in the northeastern United States. So that put the kibosh to all of that. Another thing that I'll point out is what if you have two R groups that are identical? Right, what if you had an ethyl group on one side and then you had an ethyl group on the other side? You would call that diethyl ether. So diethyl ether. And are you ready for this one? Or you could just call it ethyl ether and everybody will know what you're talking about. They'll know that it means you've got two alkyl groups that are identical. If you just say ethyl ether, they'll, they'll assume, well, it must be two ethyl groups because the person didn't mention a second ethyl group. Okay, so diethyl ether or ethyl ether would be acceptable. Let's just try one more. Let's imagine you had something like this. Okay, you had two isopropyl groups, right? You'd call that diisopropyl, diisopropyl ether, or you could call it isopropyl ether. Either one would be perfectly fine. So now that we've covered common names, let's take a look at IUPAC names or the systematic way of naming it uh, is what I should call it. And, you know, let's say we had something like this, a big compound like that. Now, I know you know that this only has one, two, three, four, five carbons. And I know you can all identify a pentyl group, but that's neither here nor there. What if it was a group that was too big for you to identify and, you know, you couldn't give it some kind of common name? Well, in that case, what you do is you take the smaller of the two sides. So you see that this side only has two carbons on it and you name it as an alkoxy group, okay? and the larger side is considered to be the parent chain. And so if we look at this example, we have pentane, which is highlighted in green, that's our parent, that's the bigger side. And then the other side, if there's two carbons, it would be an ethoxy, right? If you had just CH3O, right, you'd call that methoxy. If you had, I don't know, if you had a propyl group, I don't wanna to waste too much time on this, but you'd call this propoxy. Prop, propoxy. If you had an isopropyl, you'd call it isopropoxy, terbutoxy, butoxy, right? So on and so forth. And so you would call this compound, the name of this compound would actually be 1-ethoxypentane. That's how you would name it. So 1-ethoxypentane. I had a great question from a student one time, and he said, well, what if there were both groups that I couldn't identify? Well, in that case, I wouldn't ask you to name them, okay? I'll always give you some group that you can come up with a name for, okay? So with all that in mind, let's see if we can give some IUPAC names for these. If we can give us, if we can give a, a common name, we'll do it. And if we can't, well, then we'll do the systematic way. Well, if we look at the first one, I have an ethyl group on this side, and then I have an isopropyl group on this side. So we're gonna alphabetize according to the letter um, E. So the common name for this one, I'll just write down here, Common, common would be ethyl, ethyl isopropyl ether. However, the systematic name, so we'll put here systematic name, you find the longest carbon chain, which is one, two, three carbons. And so we would call this group over here, since it's an ethyl group attached to an oxygen, we would call that an ethoxy. So ethoxy, so we'd call this 2-ethoxypropane. So let's jot that down, 2-ethoxypropane. Okay, for the next one, uh, you can see that we could not come up with a common name for this side, so we're going to have to just go with systematic for this one. So let's go with systematic. It's the only thing we have. Um, and so our longest carbon chain has one, two, three carbons. We have another one of those ethoxy groups. The textbook seems to like those. So we have a one, we have a two chloro, one ethoxy propane, right? It's because the parent chain has the three carbons in it. So that's a propane, propane. And this is an ethoxy group. So we'd call this two chloro, 
one ethoxypropane. So let's scribble that down. Two chloro, one ethoxypropane. The only thing is that we have to identify the chiral center. Is R or S? Did anybody identify that yet? Is this chiral center having S stereochemistry or R stereochemistry? All right. Yeah, I forget to add my GIF. There we go. All right. Tiana, I see you, you switched it there at the, at the last second. All right. I think I agree with you, the S. Okay. So let's just, let me just erase some of this stuff here. Take a gander at it. So if we look at the chiral center, the hydrogen's in the back. The chlorine is going to be number one. The hydrogen is going to be number four. This carbon is attached to an oxygen. This carbon is only attached to three hydrogens. So this is going to be number two. This will be number three. So we're going like this, which is counterclockwise. Yes. And so it's S. So we'll scribble that down. S, two chloro, one ethoxypropane. And for the last one, we have an aromatic ring. We just want to give every substituent the lowest possible number here. So we're going to number starting here. One, two, three, four. So we have a a um, two four dichloro um, ethoxy. We don't have to say it's ethoxy or one ethoxy. We would just call it ethoxy um, because it would be redundant to put a one on there. So again, they really like these ethoxy groups. So we would just call this two four dichloro um, ethoxy benzene. Ethoxy. Benzene. Again, the reason we don't have to call it one ethoxy benzene is because the one is the placeholder that tells us where the two and the four are. So there's no need to put a one in there. That, again, that would be redundant. And remember, when we name a ring, we always seek to give the substituent the lowest possible numbers. If I was to start with this chlorine over here, I'd have one, three, and four, right? So one, two, and four. So we have lower numbers. We go for the, um, the first point of difference. All right, there we go. So we've named some ethers. And with all that in mind, let's get into some structures and properties. This is a politically way, correct way of saying maybe molecular geometry. <laughs> so we'll put here, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> molecular geometry and intermolecular forces. Yeah, that's really what we're talking about here. Uh, first of all, it says the bond angle in the ethers is very similar to that found in water and alcohol as well. Hopefully you remember the hybridization of the oxygen in water, it's sp3, and so the oxygen in an alcohol is also sp3, and the oxygen in an ether is also sp3 hybridized, right? When oxygen has two bonds and two lone pairs, I should say two sigma bonds and two lone pairs, it has an sp3 hybridization. But what's interesting with the bond angle is you might think, well, if my oxygen is um, has a... Uh, a tetrahedral molecular geometry, then it has a bent, right? So the molecular geometry is bent, it has a bent molecular geometry. So the bond angle should be close to 109.5 degrees. Well, in fact, when you have two alkyl groups, what they do is they repel each other a little bit. And so the bond angle is going to be a little bit bigger than 109.5 degrees. So as long as you understand greater than 109.5, Mr. Dion will be a happy camper. You don't have to memorize every bond angle of every ether under the sun. We don't have time for that kind of thing. All right. Well, you know, something that I brought up earlier was hydrogen bonding, right? And just to review, you should understand what hydrogen bonding is, and you should be able to draw, you know, let me just scribble a, another molecule of methanol over here. And you would put in your delta plus here and your delta minus here. And you would draw the hydrogen bond as a dashed line, right? So what I'm showing here is a hydrogen bond between two alcohols, right? These are alcohols, methanol. But what about an ether? Well, an ether by itself does not have the capability of hydrogen bonding. Are you with me on that? If I drew another molecule of diethyl ether here, could anybody tell me what's the strongest intermolecular force that these two are going to experience with each other? If you have two molecules of an ether, what's the strongest IMF they're going to experience? It's not hydrogen bonding. What would it be? Could anybody tell me that? 
it's not going to be London dispersion, right? Because there's a dipole, right? Because the molecular geometry is bent. So you have a dipole in an ether. So ethers, so ethers possess, possess a dipole, right? They are polar compounds because they have a bent geometry. And so the strongest intermolecular force that they are going to experience would be dipole dipole between two ethers. However, the ether molecule does have an oxygen with a lone pair on it. And so can there be a hydrogen bond between an ether and an alcohol? And the answer is absolutely. Yes, if you have an ether here, okay, and you have an alcohol over here, one of the reasons why an ether, a lot of ethers do dissolve in alcohols is because you can form a hydrogen bond between the lone pair on an ether and the hydrogen atom on an alcohol. So we can form a hydrogen bond, right? This is our H bond. And so what we call the ether is we call it a hydrogen bond acceptor because it's accepting the bond from the hydrogen atom. It doesn't have a hydrogen atom to participate in hydrogen bonding, but it can accept one. So to recap, two ethers, when they're mixed together, there's no hydrogen bonding, okay? But if you take an ether and mix it with an alcohol or a water, yes, there can be hydrogen bonding between the ether and water or an alcohol. And we say that the ether, I'll highlight it here, the ether is a hydrogen bond acceptor. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that. It's not meant to be a trick or anything mega complicated. And I shouldn't say that because it's not easy, but um, it's not meant to be a mind boggler or anything like that. So if you understood what I just said, you probably won't have struggle too much with this slide here. It says ethers cannot hydrogen bond amongst themselves. That's what I just said. Okay, they can't hydrogen bond together. And so their hydrogen, excuse me, their boiling points are gonna be much lower than alcohols of a comparable size. In fact, these two compounds have the same molecular formula. They are both C2H6O. But if you look at the boiling point of diethyl ether, it's a lot lower than that of ethanol because ethanol has hydrogen bonding, whereas diethyl, dimethyl ether has a dipole. Yes, yeah, so it only has dipole dipole for meh, dipole dipole forces between two molecules of diethyl ether. And then propane. Propane only has measly old London forces, London forces. So there you go. So that's why propane has such a low boiling point. Now, if you understood the whole concept back from uh, organic chemistry one, that is you take a straight chain alkane as you go from methane to ethane, propane, butane, pentane, hexane, heptane, octane, none, right? As the chain gets longer, the boiling point increases due to increased London dispersion forces. It's the same rationale with an ether, right? If I have dimethyl ether. Yes, there's dipole forces, but there's also some London dispersion forces between the two compounds. But if I have a really long ether, like dipropyl ether, you can see it has a markedly higher boiling point, over 100 degrees higher. Why? Because you have longer chain and they can interact and have increased London forces. All right, so you should know a little bit about the physical properties of ethers. Understand that they have a dipole. They are polar. They can hydrogen bond with a hydrogen bond donor. And you should understand that the longer they get, the more their boiling point is going, or the higher their boiling point is going to be. Well, if we look at the next section here, uh, this is kind of near and dear to my heart because I worked as a chemist most of my adult life. And so I used, you know, different ethers as solvents all the time as a chemist, all the time, all the time. Uh, diethyl ether, I didn't use that very much. And one of the reasons why is, it can react sometimes, um, but even though it is pretty unreactive, but it's got a really low boiling point of only 35 degrees Celsius. And so there's some inherent problems with that. But this molecule here, tetrahydrofuran, we call that THF. It's the cyclic version of diethyl ether, right? You just see that you tied these two carbons together. It didn't do a very good job of doing that. But anyhow, uh, tetrahydrofuran has a much higher boiling point. It has a boiling point of about 66 degrees Celsius, and it is one of the most widely used solvents in organic chemistry. Why? For two reasons. Number one, it's unreactive, okay? So it's unreactive. In fact, all three of these are quite unreactive. But the second thing is that the boiling point is kind of in a happy spot, okay? It's not so low like diethyl ether, it just flies away. But 66 degrees Celsius is a nice temperature where it doesn't evaporate too quickly, 
but you can remove it by evaporation if you need to, and it doesn't take too long to do it. Um, and the next one, 1,4-dioxane, I used that compound or this solvent many, many times. Um, it's got a boiling point of 101 degrees Celsius. I use that to, to uh, freeze dry compounds. And if you've ever had astronaut ice cream, that would be freeze dried ice cream. Anyhow, that's a whole other kettle of fish, but that's one of the things that I used to use it for a lot. So, um, you know, or, organic chemists love to use ethers like these ones, like diethyl ether, THF, 1,4-dioxane. These all make great solvents. I'm gonna write that right here. These are all excellent, excellent solvents. And again, I'm, I'm kind of repeating myself, but you know, what makes a good solvent? It's something that can number one, dissolve a lot of different types of compounds, but it's also gotta be unreactive. You want something that's not gonna react itself in your reaction mixture. And so that's why um, ethers make uh, just great solvents. All right, well, let's move on from there. Uh, section 13.4 deals with crown ethers. I'm gonna leave this section as an FYI. Okay, if you wanna read the section about crown ethers, I'll leave that as a for your information. I will not ask any questions about crown ethers on the quiz. And it also doesn't show up in the ACS. <coughs> and so I'm not saying that crown ethers aren't useful, but there's no questions about it on the final exam or the quiz. And I feel like, I think you would agree with me that we have enough content to cover already in the class. So let's move on to the preparation of ethers. How do you make an ether? All right, how would you make an ether like diethyl ether? I just told you it's a really good solvent. And so if it's a solvent, you would need to have a lot of it to dissolve compounds, you know? What if you needed 100 liters of diethyl ether? How would you make that? Well, it says here industrially, so on a very large scale, diethyl ether is prepared by the acid catalyzed dehydration of ethanol. And this is actually believed to be the mechanism. They literally just take pure ethanol and put it in with a catalytic amount of acid. So a little bit of H plus, a little bit of hydronium, which serves to protonate the hydroxyl to convert it into a good leaving group. So just to kind of go back to our organic one days, right? This is a bad, bad, son of a gun, bad LG, bad leaving group. And now you've converted it into a good leaving group. All right, and then what happens is a second molecule of ethanol can come in and act as a nucleophile. So we get nucleophilic attack, followed by loss of leaving group. So that's just an SN2 reaction. And then you do a proton transfer and you start all over again because you end up with diethyl ether and you also end up with the protonated form of ethanol, which can act as the acid catalyst to catalyze the next reaction. Um, the only caveat to this reaction, you might look at this and say, man, this is awesome. You just take some ether, crank it up with a few drops of sulfuric acid, and you make, or sorry, uh, you take ethanol, put it in with a little bit of sulfuric acid, just heat it up, and voila, voila, bing, bang, I'm making ethers. Well, the problem with this reaction is that it really only works well for simple, symmetrical ethers. So if you wanted to make an ether that's asymmetrical, right, what if you wanted to make I don't know, what did we talk about earlier? Didn't we talk about the ethyl isopropyl ether or something like that? I think I had this on a slide. Like, how would you make that? You can't make that this way. If you tried, if you tried to mix ethanol and isopropanol, you'd actually end up with a mixture of three different compounds. And I'm not going to go into what those compounds are. But, you know, how would you make something that's unsymmetrical or asymmetrical? And the answer is that you would use something called the Williamson ether synthesis and that brings me to my next slide so if you want to make an asymmetrical ether you have to use the williamson ether synthesis this is a real uccs chestnut we love to do this um, reaction with our students in the lab so if you're taking the lab currently with mr geiger i'm sure he's mentioned or he will talk about the williamson ether synthesis at some point old chemistry very old chemistry but still being used today i promise you that somebody somewhere in this state is probably doing a Williamson ether synthesis. It's such a handy reaction. And if you're thinking, well, man, it doesn't look very complicated. I just take an alcohol, right? So you take an alcohol, I treat it with sodium hydride. So remember that this compound is called sodium, sodium hydride. And you should know the Lewis structure. So sodium and then a hydride ion is a hydrogen with two electrons. So it's got a negative charge. So hydride is a dandy base. It's a crappy nucleophile, but it's a really good base. So we'll circle the word base there. 
that rips the proton off of the alcohol. You make an alkoxide, alkoxide, which is a good nucleophile. So then all you have to do is treat it with some kind of electrophilic alkyl halide like this. They're using, you know, methyl iodide or methyl bromide or something, and they're making a methyl ether. OK, so what kind of reaction is the second step here? The second step is an SN2 process. Could anybody tell me what kind of electrophiles work well in an SN2 process? What kind of electrophile or alkyl halide do we want? Do we want methyl, primary, secondary, tertiary? Does anybody know which ones work the best for an SN2? This would go back to chapter seven in organic one. Yeah, primary for sure. Yeah. So it's going to be methyl, methyl, and primary are going to work well. Secondary is mostly going to give you elimination. It would give you a little bit of SN2, but mostly elimination. And tertiary won't work at all. So secondary, we'll put frowny face because it's not going to work well. And tertiary, you know, we'll do. What a red X over that because it's not going to work. Okay, and again, a secondary is mostly going to give you elimination. So, since this is an SN2 uh, substitution, it works well with unhindered alkyl halides. What was the conclusion that we just drew? Like Audrey said, primary alkyl halides and methyl alkyl halides. I didn't mean to do that. How did I do that? Anyhow, let's see here. And methyl alkyl halides. So, what's a primary alkyl halide? Something like, you know, maybe ethyl chloride or something like that. And then a methyl alkyl, alkyl halide would just be a methyl group followed by the halogen, methyl chloride, methyl bromide, or methyl iodide. All right. So if we want to make an asymmetrical, or sorry, an, an asymmetrical ether, what we have to do is we have to look at both sides and say, well, which side should I use as my nucleophile, my alkoxide, and which side should I use as my electrophile? Right. In the electrophile, for this part, you want to choose choose the one that for your electrophile, you want to choose either a methyl halide or a primary alkyl halide, something like that. So let's take a look. Let's say you wanted to make, hey, remember this compound? I just mentioned it a little while ago. This is terbutyl methyl ether, which we give the improper acronym for, methyl terbutyl ether, which again, is it correct? I told you this compound was used as an anti-knocking agent. Well, how would you make this compound? There's two possibilities. If you look at the one on the top, so this one here, if we take terbutanol and we treat that with sodium hydride, that's going to rip off the proton and that's going to give us the terbutoxide ion. And then we react it with methyl iodide. In the second step, what happens is it's going to act as a nucleophile, right, on the methyl group, eject the iodide, and you get the SN2, and that's going to give you the product. If you tried the second route, the one on the bottom, if you chose methanol as your starting alcohol, after the first step, you'd end up with methoxide, which there's nothing wrong with methoxide as a nucleophile, but isn't there a big, big problem using terbutyl iodide as an, electro, as an electrophile? You cannot do a nucleophilic attack on a tertiary alkyl halide. What's going to happen here is it's just going to rip off this proton okay, and just do an E2 reaction. And you're not going to end up with any MTBE. What you're going to end up with is isobutylene. Okay. So, man, I'm really getting into these frowny faces, right? It's not going to work. Okay. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the rationale, because I'm definitely going to quiz you on this in the quiz 13 quiz. Okay. Uh, and also, they like to ask this on ACS, DADS, any of the MCAT. You know, they want to make sure you know the Williamson ether synthesis. One of the most important reactions that we learn in this chapter, I would say, and I know I say that about everything, but a very, very important reaction. All right, you guys ready to dredge up the past? Ready to look at something from the olden days from, well, chapter 11, so it's not that old, but this would fall under the umbrella of chapter eight. If you go all the way back to chapter eight, who remembers this reaction? Oxymercuration, demercuration, right? We learned this in chapter eight, the alkenes chapter. Yeah, I see somebody smiling. Yeah, great, great reaction. Everybody remembers this mercuric acetate and water followed by sodium borohydride, right? The first step is the oxymercuration. The second step is the demercuration. And what do we end up making? We make an alcohol, 
And if you're like, well, Mr. Dion, we covered that in chapter 12. What is, what's it doing in here? What's it doing? You see how the water is highlighted in green? Well, that must be some point of interest. And so what we can do is we can modify this reaction that you already know. And instead of using water as a solvent, what if you used an alcohol as a solvent? <laughs> what would happen then? Because then you would add the proton, sure, check a roo, but instead of having an alcohol, your H would actually be an R group. Then you have R, O, R, so you would form an ether. And if you're thinking, well, hey, alcohols can be used as solvents, you're darn right they can. So we have a name for this reaction. And don't lose sight of the fact that this proceeds with Markovnikov regioselectivity, right? The rich get richer. Check it out. We call this, are you ready for the name? You're going to love it. Instead of oxymercuration, demercuration, we call it alkoxymercuration, demercuration, right? Because you have an alkyl group, the al alkoxy, right? That refers to the R group. I'll write it here in red. So all we do is swap out water or an alcohol. So change, change solvent from H2O to some alcohol. Okay, and that R group is end up is going to end up being incorporated into the, the new molecule. And so what have you made? You, my friend, have just made ROR. And so you have made an ether. So now you know a new way to make an ether. And it's tied to a reaction that you already learned. Again, it follows the same old Markovnikov regioselectivity, but we call this anth uh, sorry, we call this alkoxy mercuration demercuration. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on. At least the rationale. Are you going to have to go back and practice it? Yes, of course. It's totally normal. If you didn't, that would be pretty crazy. So with that in mind, let's try some problems here. Let's talk about making these two compounds by a Williamson ether synthesis. So I told you, right, organic chemists love to ask questions about Williamson ether, okay? Again, old chemistry, but still being used to this day. So here we have our ether in A. We have a carbon, oxygen, and a carbon, okay? Everybody who's hearing the sound of my voice can identify an ether by now. If we were to break this bond here, right, then our nucleophile would be this, and our electrophile would be this, where we have X over here. If we were to break the other carbon-oxygen bond, so if we broke this bond over here, and then our, sorry, I put the wrong bond in the wrong place here. Then our alkoxide would be, well, I'll draw it the kind of the way it is here. Our electrophile would be this, where we have our leaving group here. And our alkoxide would be the isopropoxide like that. So which one of these is going to work? I'll tell you right now, it's only one of them. Would it be the one in blue or the one in red? Which one would be the preferred method to do the Williamson ether? Is it blue or red? Thanks, Avishi. Absolutely. It's the blue one. Yeah, 100%. Right. Why did she say that? Because this is a primary alkyl halide, but in the first one, the one in red, that's a secondary alkyl halide. So this is not going to cut the mustard. Okay, It's not going to work, whereas this one is going to work. So if I combine a primary alkyl halide with the alkoxide, that's going to give me the product. So What's my reaction sequence going to look like? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take isopropanol. In the first step, I'm going to treat it with sodium hydride. That's going to make the alkoxide. In the second step, I'm going to treat it with this compound. So I'll just put an iodide. And if you've already done it and you said, well, I put a bromide or I put a chloride, no problem. Okay, It's going to work. And so that is going to give you the desired product. That's going to give you your asymmetrical ether. All right, let me just ask you guys, so I don't like the way they drew this compound. It kind of makes it difficult to teach. So I'll just redraw it like this, and I'll put this over here. If we break this carbon-oxygen bond, then our nucleophile would be this, and our electrophile would be this. If we broke this bond here, then our nucleophile would be methoxide, and our alkyl halide would be 
this oops i mean i'll just put x you could have put iodide there or whatever anyhow which one of these is going to be the best route would it be the one in blue or the one in red yeah big time right the one in the one in red is going to give you only elimination so only e2 right but the one in blue is definitely going to work and so i'm kind of running out of space here let me just maybe move this down here a little bit and so what's our overall reaction sequence going to look like? We're going to start with the tertiary alcohol. And in the first step, we're going to treat that with sodium hydride. Then in the second step, we're going to treat that with methyl iodide or methyl chloride or methyl bromide. It's neither here nor there. It's not all that important. And then we're going to end up with our ether. So we're going to end up putting our methyl ether just like that. And there we have it. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on a Williamson Ether. Like, I'm, I'm digging this Williamson Ether stuff. Yeah, yeah. Students usually like um, uh, Williamson Ether. I'm going to put here something that I didn't do earlier. It was way back here. Maybe here, something like this. Well, let's back up. I would say you should understand this mechanism and know this mechanism. Okay, the one where you form the symmetrical ether. Um, and also, the mechanism of Williamson ether synthesis, oh yeah, you bet your bobby socks you want to know. That's a super important mechanism, okay? you got to know the Williamson ether uh, synthesis. Super important mechanism. So again, same thing here. You want to know this guy frontwards and backwards. Uh, you want to have no questions in your mind about the Williamson ether synthesis. All righty. So, I'm not going to ask you the mechanism of oxy or alkoxy mercuration or demercuration. Never have, never going to. So let's move on from there. Let's try another uh, question. This one deals with alkoxy mercuration, demercuration. Alkoxy mercuration, demercuration. And it says identify the reagents that you would use to prepare each of the following ethers. So you can see that what you added here was not water, but you added ethanol. Right, the rich got richer. This carbon had two hydrogens, and now it has one, two, three. And so, what are we going to use? In the first step, we're going to use mercuric acetate. So, mercuric acetate and ethanol. And then, in the second step, we're going to use sodium borohydride. So, that gives us our final product. Could anybody identify the alcohol that you would need? for the second one? And it's not a trick question or anything. Could you name it? And if you think you know the name, just try your best. Anybody, what's the alcohol that you would use? Heck yeah. Yeah, cyclobutanol, thanks, absolutely. Absolutely, thanks Audrey. Yeah, so for the second one, You'd use mercuric acetate. And the way that Audrey was able to identify that is she just looked at it and said, well, you know, I got this piece over here. So that's cyclobutanol. So we'll just scribble it down like that. That's perfect, Audrey. Thank you. Oops. So we already have a reaction arrow there. I'll just put step two, NaBH4, sodium borohydride. And that's it, man. That's all there is to it. So there you go. Now you know alkoxy, mercuration, demercuration. Uh, let's see here. We get, we're at section 13.6. We're cooking right along here in the lecture. What I'd like to do is just finish this one section, which isn't very long, and then um, we'll take a break before we get into 13.7, which deals with nomenclature of epoxide. So we'll take a little break before we do that. But let's cover um, section 13.6. And there's even a couple things in here that you don't really, I'm not going to ask a ton about it. So let's get into it here. And you remember how I told you that ethers are relatively, you know, I, I, I told you a few slides ago. I said ethers, unreactive, unreactive. Well, I'm going to put here relatively. Okay, I guess it will react if you hit it with a hammer. You know, if you hit it hard enough, an ether will react. So check this out. If you take an ether and you heat it up with really strong acid, and I mean a strong acid, I'm talking like HBr, you know, HI, um, what can happen is kind of this two overall phase mechanism. 
So first you protonate the, al the um, oxygen of the ether to make an oxonium ion, and then the halide can come in and do an SN2, which will give you a molecule of an alcohol, right, from one side of the ether. But then you've got another molecule of um, an alcohol. And of course, if you treat that with a strong acid, that's going to protonate again, and then you can do another SN2. So really, you know, what's the, what's the net result of this reaction? I just want to make sure it's not on the next slide. I'll write it up here. So what's happening on this slide is this. They're taking dimethyl ether and treating it with HX, okay? And what they're ending up with is you end up with methanol plus methanol plus water. So you end up with, oh God, where's my red pen? You end up with the alcohol from one side, you end up with the alcohol from the other side. In this case, they just happen to be identical. And then you also end up with a water molecule um, as well. So you end up with those three things. So if it was an asymmetrical ether, I'm just gonna scribble it up here. Let's just try, what was the one we were using before? It was ethyl isopropyl ether. So you wanna write this down. If you were to treat it with something like HI, for example, what you'd end up with would be, um, uh, you would end up with, um, sorry, I just wanna make sure there's no mistake in my notes here. T, 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 T. What is going on here? Sorry, my mistake, my mistake. I knew I was making a mistake here. So what you end up with is um, with X attached to it. Sorry, you end up with an alkyl uh, halide, my mistake, and then a water molecule. So let's just try this example here now that I flubbed that one up a little bit. By a little bit, I mean a lot bit. So what you'd end up with, what you would end up with would be ethyl iodide plus isopropyl iodide plus water like that, okay? So this is the correct form here, all right? So again, if you're trying to follow along here, you'd end up with one alkyl halide, another alkyl halide, and a water molecule. All right, so with that in mind, like I told you a couple of seconds ago, this reaction, this whole cleavage of ethers business, so I'm gonna rewrite it here again. If you have ROR and you treat it with HBr, you'd end up with R Br plus R Br plus H2O, okay? And I'll label this one R prime and this one R double prime, okay? So in case it's asymmetrical. The thing is, is this reaction only works well with HBr and HI, does not work with HCl. So HCl is a no-no. It doesn't work because it's not strong enough. Um, the thing is, the mechanism that I showed you is an SN2 mechanism, right? It showed you an SN2 here, showed you an SN2 here. If it's a tertiary alcohol, it will work, but it's not gonna proceed by an SN2. In that case, it would have to be an SN1. There is an important caveat that you will be tested on, okay? They love to ask this question. It comes up in the ACS final all the time. And that is, follow me along very carefully. If one of the R groups is aryl or vinyl, there's gonna be no reaction on that side. So what's aryl? It means if one of the sides of the ether has an aromatic ring, so if you have something like this, and a vinyl group is when you have a double bond, and then if you have an oxygen, something like this. If you have either of those, that side won't cleave. The reason why is because you cannot do an S, you can't do an SN2 reaction on an sp2 hybridized carbon. You see those two carbons I have highlighted in green? They're both sp2, and there's gonna be no um, SN2 on that. And so if you take a phenyl ether, that's what this is here, right? So if you take a phenyl ether and treat that with excess HX, which could be HI or HBr, you only do the substitution on the side that has the alkyl group on it, right? To give you the alkyl halide. And from the, from the aryl side, you're gonna end up making phenol. Right? You're not gonna get any substitution on there at all. So let me show you another example. Let me just try to scribble one over here, maybe, right? Let's say you had, um, let's see here. Let's say you had ethyl 
vinyl ether, something like this, and you treated that with HI, what are you going to get? You're going to get ethyl iodide, but you're going to get vinyl alcohol because you can't do an SN2 on that. Give me a thumbs up if you're going to remember that. <laughs> well, everybody try, try to remember that, okay? Try to remember that. I'm telling you right now, I've taught the class a long time. I know the questions that I like to ask. Uh, I know the questions that I'm obliged to ask. And this is one of those things that always comes up all the time. And this is the kind of the art end of section 13.6. There is another couple of points here in terms of the reactions of ethers. I will not ask you anything about this whole um, formation of a hydroperoxide. The only thing that I'll tell you is this, is let's say you have a bottle of diethyl ether. So this is just plain old diethyl ether, very commonly used solvent in the lab. Di nah. We'll just call it ethyl ether, okay? If you have ethyl ether in the lab, well, there's oxygen in the air. And what happens is when you leave an ether in a bottle long enough, eventually it will form hydroperoxides. And that's a very bad thing. And so we test ethers every few months in the lab to make sure there's no ether, there's no hydroperoxides in them. It's very easy to do it. You just take a little testing strip and you dip it in and you look for a color change. And if it turns purple, it means you have a hydroperoxide. So maybe I'll use, here's my purple pen. All right, if it turns purple, you have a hydroperoxide. And the reason that's bad is because they are Highly explosive, okay? And we generally frown on explosions explosions in the lab. I'm not gonna ask you any more than this, then oxygen can form a hydroperoxide. So you just go to the alpha carbon next to the oxygen and just draw OOH and that's a hydroperoxide and it's explosive. The whole free radical mechanism, I'll even write this here so you have proof, will not ask. So if you see it on the quiz, you can bring the YouTube video back and. Hey, wait a second, you said you weren't gonna ask that. Okay, so you don't have to know this mechanism. It's not part of the content of our class. You don't have to know how it all goes together with the initiation, propagation, and termination. So that covers section 13.6. Let's try a little bit of practice here. This one here, we have what? Diisobutyl ether is what you would call this. So this would be di, eh, diisobutyl ether. If we treat that with excess HBr and heat, so we're gonna break on this side and we're gonna break on this side. So we're gonna end up with two molecules of diisobutyl, or sorry, of isobutyl bromide. And what's the other molecule that I'm missing here? Yeah, thanks, Tiana. We're gonna end up with a molecule of water. So there we go, so plus H2O. For the next one, if you remember this compound, it's what I call THF, the tetrahydrofuran. It's an ether, it's just a cyclic ether, so you do the same old thing. You can end up breaking here and breaking here, and you just count the carbons. One, two, three, four. So we draw one, two, three, four. We're going to have the iodide on one of them, and we're going to have the iodide on the fourth one. So if you number this, look, one, two, three, four. And then we're also missing water, so we'll scribble that in here. And the last one is ethoxybenzene. And so I'm going to draw a blue line here and a red line here. Now, the thing that you should know is that you're only going to cleave on one side of the oxygen in this case. Could anybody tell me what I cleave on the side where the red dashed line is or the blue dashed line? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we end up only breaking on the red side. So that means we're going to end up with phenol. So there we go. So we end up with phenol and we end up with ethyl bromide. Right? And there's no water molecule in that case. And there you have it, my friends. OK, again, I'm telling you, I've taught the class a long time. We always ask this one. OK, it always comes up. So make sure you know all of these, of course. But the one where you have an arrow or a vinyl group, they love to ask that because it's kind of it's kind of like an exception in a way. It's not an exception, but it's kind of in that vein, I guess. And then again, you should also know the mechanism, right? So why don't we, before we take a break, let's do the mechanism of this one right here. Let's just give it the old college try. So I'm going to switch over to a blank document here. Chizoink. There we go. So we'll just pick some Taylor Swift blank space here. 
and we'll just uh, redraw the molecule. Practice a little bit of mechanisms, as we call it in French. That's a joke. Anyhow, so there we go. All right, what's our step one going to be? It's going to be to convert one of these sides into a good leaving group. So we do a proton transfer. We're going to make an oxonium ion like this. There we go. And then, of course, we have the bromide ion. Bromide is a crappy base, but boy, is it ever a good nucleophile, right? So that's going to come in and do an SN2 like this. So we're going to end up with our isobutyl bromide. We're going to make isobutyl bromide. Um, and now we have the um, alcohol as well. So draw that like this. And so we're going to have a second molecule of HBr, which is going to do another proton transfer. So I'll just, whoosh. it's kind of a long arrow there, but hey, it works. So let me go with something like this. Then I have another bromide, which is going to act as a nucleophile. We get a nucleophilic attack followed by loss of leaving group. And we have our second molecule of, oops, of the isobutyl bromide plus water. And so our products are one molecule of isobutyl bromide, two molecules of isobutyl bromide, and a water molecule. So again, this is the mechanism. They didn't ask for it, but this is question 13.10a. Right. There we go. So a little bit of mechanistic practice there. And this, again, is one you should know. We'll put a star by that one because you got to know this mechanism of ether cleavage. Remember, it only works with HBr and HI. doesn't work with HCl. Not a strong enough acid. Let's go back to our notes here. Come on. Here we go. So this is chapter 13. Let's see, where were we? Somewhere around here. Covered all that. And so now what I'd like to do is we're getting into the section on the nomenclature of epoxides. So we're kind of switching gears from ethers to epoxides now. And you should remember that an epoxide is a three-membered ring. That's an ether. And it's based off of what's called the oxirane system. So sometimes we call epoxides, call them AKA oxiranes. All right, and if you have a four-membered ring, it's an oxetane, an oxalane is a five-membered ring, and an oxane is a six-membered ring. But anyhow, we call an epoxide, we call them oxiranes and epoxides, they mean the same thing. Anyhow, so what I'd like to do now is take a break because this section gets kind of heavy in terms of nomenclature, but then we'll come back in some detail.